and welcome everyone to the third webinar and broadcast in the series How Train Why It Matters. My name is Fifi Peters. Good to be back with you. The construction and the operation of the Gao train system has created a lot of jobs. It's enhanced the economy and also helped to establish the rail sector here in Gauteng. The obvious next step is to assess the benefits that extensions to the rapid rail system could bring to the province. The proposed extensions to the Gao train rapid rail integrated network project will connect the people in wider areas of the province and also create a sustainable transport service for the province. The Gao train management agency has completed a feasibility study and is currently awaiting approval from the national treasury. Joining me now to examine the need to extend the Gao train's rapid rail system, the impact the extensions will have on society and the economy, as well as the funding models that will make it possible, is a panel of experts. They are William Dax, CEO of the Gao train management agency, Cyprian Morowa, Head of Transport and Logistics at the Development Bank of Southern Africa. Elizabeth Nokia, Market Sector Lead for Environment Africa at AECOM. And Ofente Mokwena, Transport Analyst and Economist. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome. I hope everyone has had a fantastic first day in Level 1 so far. Uh, William, can I kick off the conversation with you just to refresh our minds and update us as to what the envisioned extension of Gao Train 1 currently looks like? Good afternoon, Fifi, and thank you very much for hosting us. First of all, I've got to say that we mustn't talk so much about Gao Train 2 as we must about uh, an integrated approach to transport planning. I know that sounds terribly dull. It's not half as exciting as, as, as doing another car train. But you know, all this started back in 2014 when the province decided to do a 25 year integrated transport master plan. And it wanted to look ahead and say, in 2037, 2038, around there, how would people be moving in the province? What would happen if we made certain interventions? What would happen if we didn't do certain things? And that's a real cornerstone to the discussion that we've got to have. Because behind this is a reality that the population of Gauteng is going to grow significantly. You know, we projected somewhere around 20 million people by 2037. I think we had 15 and a half million already. We, we were ahead of the curve in terms of population growth. We predicted, and I don't think COVID-19 is going to have too much an impact on this, additional jobs. And we had a look at the spatial orientation of the, of, of, of the province over the next 25 years. And the single conclusion that we came to is that moving people to and from jobs in perpetuity on the roads is just not going to work. We have to have rail as the backbone of a public transport system. So then the easy question is to say, yes, well, that's fine. We've already got rail. What's, what's the issue? Why do we need to build some more? Well, unfortunately, we, we really are victims of a terrible legacy here where between the mines, apartheid spatial planning, and, uh, and just the way that the economy has moved and developed, we unfortunately have not got rail where we need to have it. And other than car train as we have it now, there hasn't been any significant investment in growing the rail network for, I think it's close to 100 years, a very scary, scary factor. So, so what we had a look at then was to say, all right, how, how do we grow the network in a way that doesn't duplicate the existing rail network, but really complements and, and, and extends it? And what we've come up with is a five-phase plan. It covers an additional 150 kilometers of rail of rail line that would then complement and join up with the, the southeastern um, quadrant at Jobalani in, in northern Soweto, link through Ruhrdeport, coming through Randburg, Cosmo City, and to Santon, really connecting the, the economic hub as we have it now. And then moving northwards up into the Twane area, heading through Irene, um, Swanee East up to Mamalodi, then ultimately also in the east-west corridor, going out past Artumbo, out um, into the Boxburg-Benoni area, and then finally heading out to Lanseria 
uh, out on the West Rand. So it's an, a very ambitious long-term long -term plan. We're currently at phase one. So remember this massive program, bill program, uh, will take 20, 30 years. Phase one is keeping Santon as the hub of a network and then pushing out into the, the near West Rand and getting to Randburg, Cosmo City, and uh, Little Falls. And then after that, phase two would follow uh, into Rodeport and Jabalani in, in Soweto. Um, and they, thereafter, phases three, four, and five would, would follow. But Fifi, maybe just if I could make a final point, and I think every viewer can, can, um, yeah, can uh, agree, agree with this. There's an issue around keeping our cities competitive. And I don't think anyone's ever been to a city with a poor public transport network that was a competitive city. Mm. And I'm afraid, and I think everyone in the province is afraid, that if we don't keep our planning for extending rail and investing in rail, we're going to lose, our cities are going to lose their competitive edge. Mm -hmm. And that's fatal in this in this um, the world as 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 we have it now. So really, this is a critical discussion that we're having now. I agree with you 100%. I mean, you, may, you visit uh, many of the mm -hmm. uh, European countries and the Americas, and it is that convenience of be, being able to move around quite freely um, in their respective cities that makes uh, those destinations uh, quite uh, pleasing to travel to. William, I want to stay with you for just a second uh, longer. You are, we're talking about phase one and, and possibly phase two here. As I understand, uh, these plans were submitted to uh, National Treasury uh, for approval in 2017 already. Uh, you can correct me there, I'm wrong. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is, is, is what's taking so long. I mean, is there de a delay in terms of getting a response from Treasury as to the way forward here? If you're right up front, this is not Treasury's fault. Um, this is a huge project. It's a very, very complex project. And Treasury has been very good at it, engaging with us as of other role players. And the two issues that they've come back to us with and, and, and work together with us on this. The one is to say, how do we make, if it is going to be a car train type project, how do we make it more accessible to more people without compromising on financial sustainability? And the second one is, how can it be funded? It can't just be 100% government funding. How do we build in private sector investment in here? How do we make people or encourage people who benefit from a project like this also contribute to it financially? So we've answered those questions. It's been a two, two and a half year process in terms of engagement on it. And a, as we speak, we're just finishing the final, the final study. So it's absolutely not a treasury um, um, caused delay. It's been a real good, robust engagement. All right, all right, and just one second longer then, and we'll unpack the funding models of this project in just a moment and give it adequate time because it is quite important, but I'm trying to understand once once Treasury uh, does come back to you, what the next steps are, and also timelines, realistically, of when we can get up and going with phase one and, and, and when it is likely to be complete. So it's a long-term process. Nothing um, will happen other than we will get stuck into our more detailed design All right. and there'd be a, a procurement process. I would say that if the approvals were given immediately, it would still be um, three to four years before any construction started. And obviously then there's a construction period and operations uh, that would be followed probably four, five years later. Okay. And, and again, so the key thing is we've got to be getting a move on now because we've got such a long lead time before anything actually happens in these massive infrastructure projects. All right. Okay. I would like to bring in the uh, transport economist now to help us understand e economically why the uh, extension of this project is a good deal for South Africa. And Lofenze, ob obviously I'm talking to you as the only transport economist on this panel, but I ask this question against the backdrop of the uh, report that was uh, published uh, recently, I believe, by uh, the Competition Commission, in which uh, the uh, project like the Hau train was uh, described um, as a, a policy mistake and something that should not uh, be the case for a country uh, like South Africa. And against that backdrop, I asked whether 
uh, extension of a project that a uh, competition commission has, has, has found perhaps shouldn't have gone on in the first place is actually warranted? Well, I, th I think uh, there are other arguments. For example, some, some researchers do argue that, in fact, the How Train project came in too late. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we sort of have to think about, number one. Number two, there are some um, dynamics that are related to the purpose of the How Train in its original form, which was basically a spatial development initiative to try and contain the spatial development of How Day against the backdrop of a future increase in vehicle traffic, vehicle travel demand. Now, within that background, you know, the corridor was anchored around that specific market segment, which was basically car owning commuters who could afford to drive and own vehicles. But in this context, it's a different kind of animal, largely because the proposed routes are targeting spaces that are not covered by the passenger rail agency of South Africa's Metro Rail, but are also development nodes as well. And, and then they intersect in some of the areas. So with regard to the Competition Commission's argument around equity, which is a valid argument when viewed from the perspective of you know, social justice, but economically, it actually sort of um, underplays the economic benefits that are tied to spatial change that you find from a high capital investment. So with regard to the how trains ext extension plans, the debate is, might actually become a little bit more complex because the issues around, for example, land use incentives, um, the precinct plans that are attached to some of the nodes that are planned, and also um, the, the manner in which the financing model is going to be structured are going to be crucial points of debate given the nature of, of the project. And also given the fact that the special purpose vehicle or the how train management agency will be the one facing this whole dimension of all these political, economic and social dynamics. Mm. Because, I mean, I think quite often when you are assessing a project and looking at the, um, the cost of, of doing, doing it, which again I say we'll discuss in just a moment, one also has to look at the, uh, the, the economic cost and the social cost of perhaps not pursuing the, the, the How Train extension uh, plan and also at this time. And Offensa, I'd just like to, to, to get you in here again because you did mention the fact that, I mean, it uh, covers a, a section or the extension will cover a section that is not currently covered by our, our, our passenger rail service but in help us understand particularly for those who continue to look at the how train as a, a form of transport for your middle class and your elite citizen what is the cost uh, to South Africa of not pursuing this project and pursuing it on time well in many ways it, it can be a missed opportunity for basically uh, achieving what we've been talking about for the past 20 years which is spatial transformation um, that's, that's just the one part. But with regard to uh, metro rail dynamics, the big challenge is that it appears as if metro rail is, is, is for the working class, so to speak. But quite frankly, the working class are people who don't own the means of production, which include the middle class as well. Now, and secondly, if you look at the manner in which Metro Rail has been enabled from a policy perspective, it could have done the same business as the how train business model um, till today, but that hasn't happened. And it's largely because somewhere between the 1990s till, to na till today, the recapitalization program of Prasa has never materialized. This year, 2020, was supposed to be the year where we would see new locomotives, improved ticketing systems, upgraded train stations, and this was supposed to complement the peak of the how train project at the moment so so what happened is that one project went on uh, through the how train management agency and the other project was derailed you know in, in not so many words so the the equity issue is a byproduct of non-decisions or a lack mm -hmm. of implementation therefore it makes it very difficult to compare both of them are apples Mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth, bringing you in here just to also unpack the um, in environmental um, aspect and case for for expanding on this project. You know, prior to William's opening remarks around the uh, rates of our population growth so far, I would have thought that um, you know 
COVID-19 has changed a lot of things by way of uh, people needing to be on the roads as much and needing to drive to their workplaces as much and congestion and traffic and, and, and. As a result of uh, the uh, business models in which many employees have had to work from home. And I do wonder then if the environmental case uh, of the uh, how train continues to stack up by way of taking motorists off the road. And this is if a lot of these companies that have had a lot of their employees working from home continue to stick to that business model because it's still working. Yeah, sure. Firstly, a happy level one to you too. <laughs> 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 just, just in general, just to quickly take you back. Um, when we are looking at, at an, a mega project or a, a mega infrastructure like Caltrain, and you come at it from an environmental perspective, you, you really are looking at two components. So when I say environment, a lot of people are going to say to me, oh, it's the birds and the bees, and et cetera, et cetera. But you're looking at your sensitive habitats, your, your fauna, your flora, your water courses, et cetera. But I think what ties in more with this discussion and um, what you've just spoken about is the sustainability aspects of it. If you start to look at the sustainable development goals and um, our green transport strategy, I think um, how train is still relevant. And I and I think from a sustainability perspective, um, the extension of how train is something that is needed because it will speak to regional connectivity, it will speak to spatial equality or equity. Um, you're going to look, start looking at um, connecting communities that were not connected in the past. Um, so it's not just about it's not just about your your people going to and from work. It is it is other components of your communities as well. So it, you have to look at it from a from a system from a from a holistic human well being perspective, um, and and you know that's where something like Caltrain really starts to make a difference. Okay, okay. And we'll review the, uh, the climate and the environmental aspects in further detail, but let's start kicking off the conversation around the, uh, the money, because I think that that is uh, what a lot of people are wanting to know in this time where money is, is, is hard to come by for a lot of companies and a lot of industries. Cyprian, as I understand, the DBSA was involved in the initial How Train project. Uh, what is your expected participation uh, likely to be in, in this uh, expansion project? Uh, this time around and if you uh, want to give us the the, the rands and cents uh, please uh, feel welcome to do so thank you Fifi uh, yes uh, we are a government bank the Development Bank of Southern Africa we were involved as a partner in phase one which is what you see today uh, the the rules that I established today um, we were involved um, also in phase two, which is the extension to new areas and, and um, additional to what you see today. Um, in the first phase, uh, we funded the rollout of the locomotives, uh, in other words, putting the train on the tracks uh, together with other institutions. Now, we played a key role there in the sense that um, we tap whatever we do as a government bank from the policy directives that we, you know, discuss with government, who is our shareholder. And those policy directives really are focused on one thing, improving the lives of the public. Can you move people safely to their destinations, cost effectively, especially uh, women and children? Do they have access to public transport? What is the situation now? And what are the global benchmarks in terms of moving public uh, from point A to point B. So it's, it's a complex project, uh, so to speak. But our ethos is that we must develop social infrastructure and economic infrastructure. And the How Train is a good example of infrastructure that we must participate in. So you have heard about the plans. One of the things that we are good at doing uh, is the development bank is that we bring together many other institutions into the funding space. In other words, no single bank can single-handedly develop infrastructure like this until it's completed. So we are a good partner. We are seen globally as a good partner for other institutions to come in and, and um, 
and be part of the infrastructure projects in South Africa. One of the key things that we do is this. Before things materialize, before you see the train, there's a lot of planning. And then there's a lot of project preparation about a specific project. So these are the details of the project. All that takes experts, it takes money. We have a pot of funds at the bank um, and that those funds are used to develop these projects to a point where now you can invest and roll out and you see the infrastructure. So before you see it, there's a lot that has to happen. There's a lot of money. Mm. So the DBA with these partners helps fund that process as stage one. And once that's clear, we move into stage two, wherein we actually finance or we are part of the funding solution to deploy the asset so that you actually use it and the public can, can see it. That's mm. in short our involvement so far in phase one and phase two of the Houteng project. All right, all right. I mean, uh, what uh, keeps being emphasized at this uh, stage is the social and the economic aspects of why this project is a good deal for, for all in, in this country. But, uh, Cyprian, I'm interested in your your second role that you were talking about as the DBSA being um, sort of in charge of leading these financiers to come and put their money in, in a project such as the How Train. And I'm wanting to know how you think that that is going to be like in this current uh, climate where a lot of institutions are having to think really hard about where they put their money because they don't have as much money as, as, as they did because of the, uh, the manner in which the crisis has dwarfed profits. So, so do you expect to experience any challenges in attracting funding in that regard? Yes, Fifi, it's, um, it, you're spot on there. Um, COVID has thrown a... Uh, uh, a bit of uh, spanner in the works, but but we take a long view to things. Uh, COVID will be gone tomorrow. Um, and what we have seen in the markets is that generally money has become expensive for projects. And um, in a lot of situations, uh, some projects have had to delay, but I think it's very, very important to keep your eye on the ball and to take a long-term view. There is money that if you take a long-term view, can still be deployed in projects like this. So yes, it is a bit more difficult, but you know this is why if we look at track record, if you look at uh, the professionalism that's being displayed around projects, and if you look at the project dynamics, if they are robust, investors know this and they can distinguish a good project from a non-good project. And I think we're on track on this one. All right. Thank you, Vivian. Okay, thanks, Supreme. And just uh, to clarify, when you said COVID will be gone tomorrow, you didn't literally mean tomorrow. It's figurative, figuratively uh, tomorrow. Um, and that, that is important. So I don't want you to get misquoted in, in newspaper headlines tomorrow. Um, just joking. Um, for, okay. All, okay. <laughs> for, <laughs> for everyone who is uh, tuned into this webinar online, uh, please, we welcome your thoughts um, on it. Any comments that you have or any questions that you do have for uh, some of the panelists, uh, we are here to take them. And as we keep the ball moving, regarding the topic of funding. William, to bring you back in here, I understand that the initial uh, funding structure of the How Train uh, project was, uh, it was 10% financed by the private sector and 90% um, footed by, by government. This time around, I'm reading a lot of reports in which you're quoted saying that um, you're looking ideally at a, a structure in which uh, the private sector participation is increased to 30%. Uh, you've got government that also takes about a third of the, the project in terms of funding. And then you've got other possible revenue uh, streams. I'm reading a lot about uh, vehicle license fees, possibly, and airport tax, and even VAT. So perhaps can you just paint a bit of a color on the, the funding metrics and the viability of these other streams that we are hearing of? Sure, Fifi. Uh, what we did was we started out as part of our engagement with, with Treasury to sit down and just say, listen, let's get it clean sheet of paper. Let's put down all the possible sources and this. And we looked at absolutely everything from general tax increases um, to fuel taxes, to fuel levies, congestion charges, which uh, haven't happened in South Africa yet, um, all the way through to the more traditional um, fu funding sources and also looking at developer charges, bearing in mind that people who develop around existing hard train stations have seen massive increases in the value of their, of the, of their properties. And we then um, did quite a detailed analysis of what 
could each source bring and would each one, which one of them would be the most, the most viable. So I think from a, from a policy point of view, what became very clear is that in South Africa, we very um, clear that we want to move away from carbon intensive modes of transport. And we want to be progressive in terms of um, moving investment over to, to, to types of investment that are much more carbon efficient. And that's the long-term essential need in, 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 in what we're doing. So we've had engagement around looking at um, usage of the carbon tax, which National Treasury had, had, had brought in a few, a few years ago. We think we, we accord quite, quite well with that. Then if we have a look down um, into other sources, we do need to be moving people off roads. There, we firmly believe that um, the, the people in cars don't pay their fair share in terms of um, the, the, the taxes that, that they pay and the failure of the e-toll system, I think, has perpetuated that, that, that problem. So we've had a look at, at vehicle license fees. It's not an infinite source. It can't go up much. Karting can't become uncompetitive in terms of its vehicle licenses compared to other to other provinces. But there is a, a strong case to be made to be made there. Then, in terms of private sector contributions, um, there's a strong will willingness from private sector developers to invest in new stations, uh, as long, of course, as they are transit oriented developments that they and actually get a return from. So we would be looking at seeing retail, commercial activities, not just next to stations, but actually in stations and being part, part, of, part, part of stations. And of course, we'd be looking then at, at, at the use of land, not just at stations, but, 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 but around it. And then of course, getting private sector investment in the infrastructure itself, because the people who use the trains will pay for them. And, and by the way, I think it's really important. There seems to be this massive misconception that people who use the current car train are massively subsidized in terms of the operations. It is just not true. You know, I think when we compare the actual operating costs of car train with the money that people pay to use it, it's been close to 100% recovery. COVID's obviously messed that up a bit. But um, up, up to date, so people who use the train actually pay their way. And that goes a long way towards um, uh, financial long-term sustainability. So government subsidy to date has really been around the capital part of, of the car train. And we would look to continue that, that, that going forward. So to summarize, we would be looking at a blend of um, national government funding, provincial government funding, um, private uh, people who use the train, private developers contribution, as well as those who invest in the train itself. All right, all right. And uh, Ofense, as, as an economist, what, what do you think about the, the viability of these uh, funding um, models? And uh, of course, I mean, William is saying that uh, there's a, a certain, perhaps a percentage of uh, motorists on, on, on the roads who don't quite pay their way the way that they should. Um, I believe that they don't agree because uh, you can just see what the central numbers are telling us by the way of tolling. But uh, the viability of these alternate funding streams uh, working, what do you think? Well, I think in many ways we we have to be very um, conscious of the the kind of risks that we expose ourselves to from a funding perspective, because that changes the dynamics of your returns. So one thing for sure is that there will be some controversial options and there will be some options that are more attractive and are more acceptable by the public. And, and that's something that you'll have to balance, especially in order to negotiate a good allocation risk. But then if you look at, for example, uh, the, the key issue here, which is whether there are viable alternatives and whether this particular service will be attached to the existing system. And that is gonna be crucial because what you want is to be able, number one, to ring fence financing. Um, and and that, that has to be very clear. And number two, to justify that, you actually have to have public buy -in. You know, and, and that's going to be crucial because for a project of the scale, the last thing that you want is risk um, on the infrastructure, on the programs, or even at a political level. 
So whatever the financing options that are decided or are pursued, the key here is to contain and manage the risk. And just uh, as a final point, there's also the risk of modal exclusion or parallelism. So in other words, for example, why, why not you know, branch into a deeper relationship with whether it's bike sharing schemes, minibus taxis, and the existing bus services? These are almost, these are essentially part of the discussion to justify um, uh, digging into the public finance environment. And, 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 and you almost can't separate them. It's not just about the project only. It's also about being able to manage the public perception, the allocation risk, and of course, making sure that the project retains its social, economic, and political viability. So the numbers count, but there's a lot more to it. Mm, mm, mm. All right, so we are receiving quite a number of questions from the audience that are tuned into this webinar, and thank you so much for your, enga your engagement, that are focused on the, the green um, aspects of this project, the climate change uh, factors, and I'd like to just spend a little bit of time here, um, if, if, if you'll indulge me. Uh, Elizabeth, to bring you back, uh, in terms of the, the, projects, the project spec, as you have seen it, as you have understood it, uh, reviewing what happened the first time around, uh, is there any, any suggestions from your corners, perhaps, on how, how this project can better tick the uh, boxes when it comes to the, the climate change and the sustainable development uh, goals? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I mean, climate change, I think, if anybody still doubts <laughs> in the reality of it, I think this year more or the last two, three, two, three years more than anything has has proven um, just what kind of an impact um, it will have on our lives, on our economy, on our communities, etc. Um, so with something like like Caltrain, it is it is a shift to a low carbon economy. Um, it is a modal shift from road to rail, which is something that is required or that is needed in terms of addressing climate change or starting to address it at least. Um, and I think what's, what needs to happen is that we need to um, involve as many voices um, and as many forms of knowledge as soon as possible in, in the planning and the execution phases of the project. Um, to, to get it on the right track, to, to get that buy-in that we were just speaking about from our, from our communities um, and from the interested and affected parties um, uh, in close proximity to, to where the routes are, are planned for. So um, certainly I think that's, that's the route that we need to go. Certainly, and William, to bring you back uh, just to understand uh, better the, uh, the green ticks that this uh, project is going to uh, bring, um, there is a question that has come uh, from the, the webinar regarding the energy usage strategy on how train infrastructure and to dovetail on that um, the consideration possibly of solar pvs on that infrastructure the carports and rooftops currently or whether this is something that you will integrate into the second the second phase of the how train we'd be the dumbest people in the world if we didn't Fifi. <laughs> you know if you look at the at the cost of electricity and how it's changed since 2005 when, when construction Came in. And I think as a society, we've moved away from um, the sense that the, we've got this endless supply of ESCOM electricity. Uh, so we would be very focused on, on reducing dependency on, on ESCOM and with all the benefits that would come from having a much greener supply of, of electricity. It's important to say, though, that you can't run trains on solar power or wind power, though. So we'd be very much focused around around the stations are how to make those much, much more energy energy efficient. Then we'd be looking at technologies by which the train could actually put power back into the grid. Um, is a, there's a technology that's been around for a few decades now that we can definitely take advantage of that that, that makes us actually a contributor um, back into the, in, into the grid as well. 
Mm-hmm. And just uh, finally there, will there be uh, the possibility of more buses over the weekends, William? Uh, this actually comes from a, tourist, a tourism operator as you were speaking about, you know, the need for improving our rail system as uh, making us a, a more competitive city to visit. But according to this individual's point of view, um, a lot of people don't have access over the weekend. There's a lot more demand that comes over the weekend. And in that regard, is there a room for increasing the number of buses that do operate? We're looking at a, a new and much smarter model of providing bus services on, on weekends. You know, when we started out with our large buses, it was very much on a model of moving commuters to and from stations. And what we found was that they were fine during peak periods, but they're actually very inefficient in off-peak periods, and that would include weekends. So we started this model of contracting with minibus taxi associations where they buy 22 seater buses that can serve lower density routes and and be more efficient off peak so that is definitely something that we'd be looking at for weekend services especially around routes that go to tourist destinations and it would be very good for us from a, a rail point of view as well because typically the moment that someone's going to be on a bus or a minibus they'll also be on the train uh, which pushes up our off-peak off -peak ridership, which is uh, uh, obviously a very sensible, sensible thing to do. So short answer is yes, we would definitely be looking at that. All right. Okay. Going back to the investment case uh, of, of extending this and expanding this project and why it is so important. Uh, Cyprian, there is a, a question that I believe you are in the best position to answer, and it is um, around the, the, the argument uh, that you are going to put towards the, uh, the, the private sector, but uh, specifically, I'm sure, your, your institutions as to why they should get involved here. And of course, you're going to be doing it at a time when, as you did highlight, it will be challenging because uh, budgets are, 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 are tight. But what motivation within this constraint of tight budgets will you be putting at their door? Uh, Fifi, you know, private uh, money or private investors are driven mostly by one thing only, the returns. Because there's so many other projects globally where you know investors could place their money so we have to compete this is what william also pointed out that it's a basket of things that we have to put on the table for investors um so that they feel comfortable maybe to take slightly lower returns uh because the, the environment is less less risky but ultimately they are driven by 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 the returns so that's the primary one we we shouldn't uh, gloss over that one um, but there are other investors uh, who are of a development finance nature, like ourselves. And you find that uh, the return issue becomes less important because there is a secondary role which speaks to developing a nation or developing the region. This is the development angle that only development finance institutions uh, in partnership with government would look to to say in this project, there's so much development, we are improving the lives of people, the safety, cost effectiveness. So it's a blend of issues. So in essence, the private developers will get their return. DFIs will get their return also, which is a return, a financial return as well as the, uh, you know, the development impact that we look for in projects. And I think if you take a holistic approach to that, um, and then you reflect on the project. Uh, and I think William did mention the number of cash flows that could be generated from different aspects of the project. In the end, if you aggregate that, you find that this will turn out to be a very good project for any investor. Thank you, mm. Viv. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the case then? I mean, as we do continue to uh, speak about driving uh, social inclusion and making uh, a lot more um, aspects and a lot more uh, features in our society open to a lot more people. What about the argument then that comes to investing more in, in the metro rail, uh, for instance, uh, offence? Uh, William did touch on the fact that investments into rail for some reason um, over the past, over the recent while here in South Africa have, have, have been dwindling. And we see it with the fact that our metro rail uh, is, is, is not as, as 
up to the standard as a lot of people would feel comfortable in traveling in, is then, then not a case to be made to perhaps direct more investments there or perhaps integrate that rail with the current Gao train rail? Is this a feasible path that could also be pursued? Well, that is an interesting question because if, if you think about it, the, the premise that we're operating in in South Africa is that we've, we've always had a, a monopoly in terms of passenger rail. Um, and then now you've got an infrastructure and operator kind of uh, model that we see with the how train. And the premise that we have is that, you know, the how train will continue, at, the how train management agency will continue functioning even as it extends into the townships and, and areas that are not covered by the Metro Rail network. Now, with that in mind, Metro Rail comes from a history of basically spatial segregation. And that's, that's basically what the spinal cord is really about. And the Gao Train's extension lines appear to be trying to match the gaps. So basically close off the loops and, and enable a much broader, more comprehensive kind of in, level of integration. But if we were gonna say that why not invest in something like Metro Rail, you know, it, using the same kind of model as the Gao Train. My answer to that would be that if you look at Metro Rail's policy, so the Legal Succession Act um, is very clear on this, that you know, PRASA has the capacity to do exactly this. They have this capacity. And this is made even worse by the fact that the most recent bill that's on the table almost enables private operators to come in to the railway market and basically use the infrastructure. So there is room for new entrants to come and participate. But for Metro Rail, their biggest challenge seems to be the fact that they are not geographically confined, meaning they're not run at a municipal level, if you or provincial level at least. If you look at, for example, the How Train or the How Train Management Agency, that's within the provincial provincial sphere provincial sphere of government. But if you look at your know, Metro Rail, it's tied up to the national space. As far as the Western Cape is trying to get you know, um, the rail function devolved just so that they can open up the market. So, so in short, there is room for this kind of you know, development, but it has to come from Metro Rail. It has to come from Prasa. Right. And there are lessons that can be learned from the business model that you see in the oh. and, and we cannot neglect the fact that that's the situation that we're in at the moment. Okay. Okay, okay, perfect. Thanks for uh, settling that for us. Uh, William, um, who's going to build this? And, and I ask against the, uh, the reports that uh, have been you know, there for people to read regarding uh, the, the, the first uh, construction partner here, Marianne Roberts, uh, selling out <laughs> of construction. The industry is, is in, in tatters. And uh, we, of course, also read uh, reports about the, the, the losses that that construction company actually made building this project. So there's a lot of concern about who's going to build it. Is it uh, do we have local capacity to pursue this ex expansion project? And if we don't, uh, the, the, do we get foreigners to come on board? How do you see this happening? Yeah, Fifi, you know, the construction industry in, in South Africa should be a case study in terms of boom and bust. It goes through these tremendous cycles. When car train, as we have it, was, be, was being built, it was in one of the boom cycles. Um, there were issues around um, collusion on, 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 on pricing. You'll all, you'll all remember that. But there was also this massive enthusiasm that we could build just about everything. Now we're in the bust cycle and you're all saying, oh, you know, it's dead forever and it's, it, it, it's gone away. I, I think what the construction industry needs is a steady supply of infrastructure projects that it can bank on. And it will also lead to a tremendous localization and transformation in, in the industry. You know, I also have a lot of sympathy for construction company CEOs. Their order book, I, I don't know if there's anything past three years, you know. So we are on the government side have really got to put in place a steady stream of projects that the market, the, the, the construction companies can know will be there and that they com can compete fairly on. Once that happens, rehiring, retraining, skilling up of people, um, 
building up of balance sheets will happen again. We just mustn't let it become another boom cycle followed mm -hmm. by, by a bust time. Now, please, I'm not for a moment saying that, that this network extensions would be the silver bullet that would solve all the projects. Sure. <laughs> I'm simply saying that it could be one of many projects that um, government puts out into the market that lead to this re, 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 into, um, generating of, of, of a construction industry in South Africa, because we're going to need it. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to pay in dollars and, and in MIMBI and, and, and all sorts of foreign currencies for people to come in and build stuff for us. That will be a disaster. Uh, certainly, we can't afford any more foreign currency on our balance sheets um, after this COVID uh, period as it is. Uh, William, uh, one more question uh, for you for now. Uh, in terms of you know making the case for this project to go ahead, especially in this climate where you've got a lot of people who have lost uh, jobs as a result of the way that society has been shifted so much so, I did read that, is that apparently 170,000 direct jobs is the potential impact that this project could could bring on board. Uh, just, just talk to us about that as you also uh, lay down the other economic uh, aspects and spin-offs that we could get from expanding. One of the fantastic things about infrastructure projects is the enormous boost they have Fifi, for, for job creation up front mm -hmm. in the construction phases. So that's where this enormous number of jobs comes, come, comes from. What's really important behind it, though, is the industries that supply the goods and materials into that construction phase, and then going into operations that then make sure that there's local supply chains that hire people, factories that build components, and so on and so on, that really create and then sustain these jobs over, over time. So it's a very good prospect for job creation if linked in well with industrialization programs, it has even greater benefits over the next over the next 10 to 15 years. Then from an economic impact point of view, and I, I did touch on it, obviously spending money on infrastructure uh, has a very positive impact on, 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 on the GDP. But our studies show that um, we can get around two rand for it, over two rand for every rand that's invested in the heart rate. Mm. But a lot of that comes from having, as I said, more competitive and more efficient cities that function. Mm. So someone who's then starting up a small business says, I can do that in Johannesburg. I can, I can start up a, 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 a company in, in Randburg. Properties maybe will be cheap there. I can have employees coming in from various parts that have safe, reliable transport links into where I'm, I'm, I'm going to be. If I need to get to the airport, I can be there within 20 minutes, and so on and so on. And these really impact on these investment decisions. Now, we can't get a handle on the jobs that that would, that would create. I think it, it rounds into um, uh, more speculation than, than science. But what we do know and what our studies show us is that it does happen around the world. You know, where efficient transport systems are developed, the secondary and tertiary sort of benefits do 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 start um, do start playing a part. And I heard a very good quote this morning, and it, it came from someone outside of South Africa, who's being critical about his own his own country. He said, "We're so good at counting the cost. We know the price of everything. We just don't know the value of it." So really, what we're trying to do here is just demonstrate and do some studies that show what value can flow from good good investments. And again, we're saying that a good investment would be in a modern, efficient public transport system that would follow on from, from the heart rate. Mm, mm, mm. You know, I, I, I think the, the case uh, for why this is a good investment has been adequately made, and I'm just looking at some of the feedback that we are getting on the, uh, the, uh, the audience that are tuned into this webinar, and no one is uh, necessarily saying that this is, this, is, this is a bad thing. So it's a good investment, but now the issue is around when this investment is really going to get going. And uh, Cyprian, just given the, the DBSA's involvement in our 100 billion rand infrastructure fund and uh, the fact that you are a lot closer to a lot more government ears than many of us here on this webinar is 
is there anything that you can comment on realistically in terms of timelines as how you see uh, this 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 project unfolding or if there's anything that the DBSA in itself can do to you know put the uh, accelerate the accelerator on on the uh, approvals and the various approvals that still have to be received yeah you, if, if you, uh, you took the words out of my mouth uh, we really as a development uh, you know finance institution we intervene to accelerate projects in other words where the market was sort of hesitating we would come in put in project preparation funding and we get to uh, the investment stage of that project. So we have done that in this project. This is how we became partners with GMA, putting in the necessary funding to do the planning, uh, the what we call the feasibility studies for, for, for this project. So that has happened. Uh, with our partners, uh, we've given funding for that process to, to accelerate. I think what's left is that, uh, you know, I think in the framework of the, the bigger infrastructure programs for the nation, which the president has, has shared with us, uh, I know there are priority projects that have been cited. So I think we're just having to be a bit patient so that we are led as to when to get in, into it. And I think William would have more details around, you know, wh when to kick off. But we are ready. We, we, we played our role and we want to play the next role, which is the actual funding of the project. Um, so that the public gets to, uh, you know, use this public transport, which is safe uh, and accessible for uh, the public, uh, compared to w what else is, uh, you know, in other in other parts of the country, mm. uh, of the world. Sorry. Mm. So in mm. short, yeah, we are there. So you've done all we, that you can ready. do. We've done all you can do. We are just waiting for whoever will actually uh, allow us to proceed uh, further. I mean, Ofensa, perhaps you can also weigh in here. And uh, we were talking uh, about the the length of time that it does take for, for such projects, uh, infrastructure projects, but perhaps South Africa is a little bit of a unique case. And we're only talking about phase one and phase two right now. There's five phases to this thing um, completely. Is there is there anything, as you see it, as an as outsider, just a observing the dynamics in the economy and uh, with that in-depth understanding of how uh, uh, projects of the scale are rolled out that you are concerned about in terms of timelines and in terms of perhaps even further delays than we're currently experiencing right now? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Huh? <laughs> uh, you know, when you, time, time is a complicated issue when it comes to projects like these because the, when you're collecting data for your feasibility study, you're dealing with one generation of people. And then you're go, your commuter base is probably going to be individuals that are in a different age group. Well, it might be the same people who are in your survey, but you've got a whole other generation that's coming in as well. And that creates a, a unique type of um, project volatility, largely from whether it's from a, a public perception point of view, um, or it is from a market use point of view. And, and the expectation is that globally, you know, the way in which people are using their cars is changing. Um, and there's a high likelihood that people will be interested in cycling, walking and using public transport, given that the right kind of land use is there. But then there's also a spirit of confidence in townships. And if the how train, for example, in current format can basically align itself with this kind of spirit of change, then perhaps it might be able to navigate through the generational shifts that will that it will have to confront. Metro Rail and, and its you know policy infrastructure was basically built around you know 1909. That's when the principles were there, and we are still dealing with the policy principles of then today. And and we have to be able to confront this temporal factor. You know, will the how train as it is now be what we are seeing in 20 years from now? Or will we have other operators in the market taking a piece of the pie, competing and producing even further extensions on a continental level even? So not, that's what I'm seeing you know, in general. I'm more sensitive about the, the temporal aspect with regard to these kinds of projects and, and just yeah. trying to contain that level of risk.
All right. uh, Elizabeth, I mean, as we do await for the, uh, the project to uh, finally get up and going, I mean, a lot of people will be staying near the, the areas where a lot of this construction will be taking place. And uh, we were talking about, you know, things that uh, people need to take into consideration when they get involved in these community meetings and stakeholder engagements, other aspects that they need to be aware of uh, such that down the line they don't wake up and, you know, dislike a project and perhaps lead to, uh, or their, their dislike leads to some form of... Uh, a social tension that ends up in project delays. Uh, what is it that mm -hmm. uh, stakeholders who will be engaging in this uh, conversation regarding the extension, particularly the community, what is it that they need to, to uh, be aware of and bear in mind? Um, yeah, yeah, stakeholder engagement and the process to follow. Um, that's one of the things that's going to contribute to, to our timelines here. Because eventually this thing will, uh, this project will end up in an environmental impact assessment. Uh, with its stakeholder engagement. And I think for a community, um, it is important to educate yourself. Um, uh, you have the right and you have the responsibility to participate in these kinds of processes. Mm. I mean, the National Environmental Management Act has very clear requirements in terms of the level of, of stakeholder engagement, um, uh, public participation, um, etc. that 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 needs to happen but so often uh you encounter stakeholder fatigue uh people are just not getting involved as much as they should be um so come informed when you come to a meeting uh come with an open mind make sure though that your voice is heard um and it is critical that um, people are involved and pulled into this so that they can feel that their own part of it um so um yeah be informed educate yourself um, have agency uh when you get involved in in these kinds of projects um i think it is it is vital for the success of them uh for the communities around them to really feel part of what is planned um in their environment Definitely, definitely agreed. I mean, and as I was uh, speaking to many of you over the weekend and uh, point that offensive raid, which is quite valid uh, regarding stakeholder engagement, is that when the Sandra, when Sandra was engaging the various uh, motorists then about this user pay principle uh, concept of uh, theirs, a lot of motorists weren't motorists then because, of course, they were too young. And uh, fast forward a couple of years, and now we are the very same motorists that feel we weren't consulted because we were not of driving age, but are now having to foot that bill. And that just speaks to the complexity of uh, running these stakeholder engagements and the importance for projects like this to actually be delivered, delivered on time. But uh, William, uh, just to uh, ask you to uh, finish things off for us, and we're gonna, we started with the money and we're going to end with the money, but this is now a question about the money from a consumer's point of view, because there is still that perception and experience, I think is also a very important word to highlight with the How Train about affordability. And a question that has come through, which is important, uh, uh, is around, you know, with the affordability of the, the how train in the view of the, the, the person who has asked being out of reach for a lot of people, the majority of people in their view, um, what then will this possibly mean for a phase two and the ability of consumers then to be able to afford, to afford taking the ride on the train? Fifi, so we've got to start off with, with some basic maths. I mean, assuming that the operating costs are what they are and, and they've been optimized and there's no um, padding of them in any way, basically the two people who pay or who cover those operating costs are the users or some form of subsidy. And I'm leaving aside additional revenue sources, et cetera, which must be, must be maximized. So what we've had a look at is to say, how do we avoid subsidizing people who don't need to be subsidized? Don't subsidize William Dax traveling from Hatfield to Midrand. He doesn't need a subsidy. Go and have a look and say, who needs a subsidy from Jabalani to Santon, for example? That then takes us into the realm of how to, how, how to apply that. And we believe that there is room for a a, a, a area-based subsidy approach using a smart ticketing system. Okay. Obviously, then we could also have a look at diff different travel times to be much more sophisticated about um, who's traveling, when they're traveling, how they're traveling, so that we can have uh, a, a, 
a criteria for applying fares to different to different people that really improves the accessibility. So it really would be a new generation of technology combined with a smart subsidy policy. The underpinning element of all of this, and I think it's been a key failure in many, many rail systems around the world, is to subsidize unknowingly and to say, man, we just this is a transport system for the poor, we'll cover operating costs. What happens then is that you forget about your long-term capital costs, you're maintaining your assets, and gradually those systems then depreciate down to a point where they actually don't even serve their primary purpose of, of, moving, of moving people. So that would be a, an example of a failed system. So really, we're trying to be smart about this while being very, very sensitive to people's affordability challenges. We're not saying we've got the perfect solution, but mm. we think that we can deal with this in a, in, in, in a smart way going forward. Mm -hmm. William, thank you so much there for your honesty and uh, that bringing us, of course, to the end of this very crucial uh, discussion. In fact, when we started uh, this uh, series on the how, train and why that matters, a lot of interest uh, was tailored into the expansion projects and whether that was uh, still going to go ahead and whether it would go ahead on time, given uh, what COVID-19 has done to a lot of projects uh, causing a delay. It is uh, very refreshing to hear that things, uh, the ball is still rolling, a, a few delays here and there, but the ball is still rolling and there's quite a lot of uh, plans um, on the table regarding addressing key issues, uh, mainly being funding. We uh, certainly do await to, to see the ball uh, get in full swing, as I certainly look forward to the day where I can take a how train from Santon straight to my hometown in Soweto, but we will continue to watch this space. I'd like to thank the uh, panelists for participating uh, with uh, this discussion this afternoon. That is William Dax, the CEO of the how train Management Agency. Agency, uh, Cyprian Morowa, the Head of Transport and Logistics at the DBSA, Elizabeth Nokia, the Market Sector Lead uh, for Environment Africa at AECOM, and of course, Ofense Mokwena, Transport Analyst and Economist. And I'd love to thank uh, the audience who have given their comments and their feedback and all your insights. Thanks so much. It's always such a great pleasure speaking with you as always. And that is where we wrap up the uh, discussion. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, from myself, Fifi Peters, it is bye for now.